Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Today's podcast episode is proudly sponsored by Timo, the award winning app designed to support neurodivergent people just like yourself with routine and scheduling. Head to your app store and type TIIMO to learn more. Booyakasha! Welcome back to the 4TOT podcast. How are you doing today? Just thought I'd give you a little bit of the old Ali G intro, of course. This is a very important day today because I have finished work for a week and I've got some time off to chill out and to to get my head straight, to get rid of this burnout that's seeming to um, accumulate and relax. Today, we are talking about something that I think most people on the internet, most people with social medias, YouTubers, podcasters, whatever, I've already made a podcast or a video on COVID-19. And to give it a little bit of the autism mental health spin, today we're going to be talking about autism, OCD, and COVID-19. Of course, there's going to be some different struggles that people have, whether they're on the autistic spectrum or have some type of mental health issue or What's the politically correct term for it? (laughs) Something along those lines. Today, I am joined by Anna, who has got in contact with me via email, as I've said to everybody on the podcast. Um, If you want, you know, if you wanted to to get in contact and and possibly be on the the 4080 podcast, then you could. And Anna has been one of the first people who has actually followed up on that and got in contact with me. Anyway, I'll stop rambling. Anna, how are you doing today? Oh yeah, I'm thank you. I'm doing I'm doing okay. Um yeah, I've just been having quite a sort of laid back day following the same old routines at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, always always okay. From our little sort of pre chat we we talked about the the impact of COVID on your your ability to kind of function. And one of the things that you highlighted was your O C D. I think germophobia, did you describe it as yes OCD obsessive compulsive disorder mainly around germs illness getting sick picking up illness from other people and getting contaminated in general that's the sort of main bulk of my OCD but I also um also have a bit of checking OCD as well where I'll check the oven before I go Mm. to bed and things like that not like not too much but I have a particular ritual where I have to check it properly before I go to bed um, and I'm just very, very anxious in general. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing it on COVID-19. Because I, I think everybody can imagine how difficult life must be for someone who struggles with, you know, needing needing to be clean and needing to, to make sure that you don't get contaminated and infected and stuff. It sounds like it could be a very tumultuous, tumultuous? That's not right. Turbulent yeah, time. <laughs> turbulent time for you so just for everyone's knowledge just to kind of introduce you would you like to give a little bit of a background to who you are what you do for work what kind of things you enjoy yep so um hello everyone so my name is Anna um because of my um extreme anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder um I'm not fit for work so I can't of work like mm. conventionally yeah, um, obviously because I can't really, you know, someone, someone. This is even before COVID. Someone only has to like cough or exhibit signs of illness, and I'll be like out of mm. the room, which is difficult. And then, and then on top of that, obviously being autistic as well, it just kind of compounds it. So I can't work conventionally, but I do as far as I'm able. I try and do voluntary work because I like to be active and I like to feel like I'm contributing in some way. I still try as far as far as I can to to do things. Uh, for example, I attend two groups 
at autism groups. So yes, it's a group just for autistic women, which is really good as we running now for a couple of years. And I also attend a self-advocacy group as well. The idea being that we come together once a month to sort of discuss ideas and helping each other out so with various issues um could be I don't know like anything from benefits to employment mm-hmm. things like that but also just a sort of talk and it's like it has a sort of social component so we always have a check-in where we tell each other how we're doing what's been going on and then if anyone's got any problems people could kind of chip in and try and help them and things like that so I really enjoy that but that's that's kind of as far at the moment as far as my kind of activities go I guess mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. it's better than nothing because um, it's like a regular routine and I always look forward to these groups. Uh, but other than that, um, I kind of fill my days really by doing a lot of reading. I'm an avid reader. I'm a bookworm. I am I absolutely love books. So I read every day for two hours. That's a very important part of my routine in the morning. Wow. And as I was saying to uh, Thomas before we started a podcast, one of my major special interests is in food and cooking. So I collect cookery books. But yeah, so that's kind of a little background. Cool. And uh, one thing that... I found quite funny is that a lot of the things that you, you've been interested in, like with with your cooking and with, um, I think you said with with your history degree as well. Yeah, we we, we have very very different sort of special interests and stuff. <laughs> I absolutely hate cooking. It's it's one of it's one of the things that I find the absolute most difficult thing. I've got my cleaning done. I can dry my clothes. I can wash up I can do all of that stuff but when it comes down to cooking my energy levels just drop but um, I think you were saying Thomas before you were into like gaming and um yeah uh, things like that whereas that's like it's funny that that's something I'm not really I'm not particularly into gaming yeah but yeah it's it's interesting like showing how two autistic people can have such different areas of interest I guess yeah it is well I, I suppose that one one thing that we do share is an interest in psychology and autism, philosophy as well, I think you said. Yeah, oh yeah, so I love philosophy, really interested in that, yeah. Anything to do with the mind and the human condition. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. So what is your relationship with autism? When were you diagnosed and what sort of self-discovery journey did you go on? Once you once you got the news, so I was uh, I was diagnosed late, uh, which is not uncommon for women. I think um, because women are historically underdiagnosed compared to men. So I grew up without a diagnosis, feeling like very different. Like why why can't I make friends? Why why can't I fit in? Feeling weird, feeling on the outside. I I, I mean teachers were aware that I had issues um, from when I started primary school. In actual fact, shortly after I started school, one of the teachers said to my mum, yeah, she said to my mum, you need to try and interact more with other parents at the school gate, she said, and that will help Anna learn to socialise. My mum kind of didn't really like that because she sort of felt like she was being blamed for my social difficulties. Yeah. So teachers were aware of it, but they just, they didn't understand it. And so I was called an enigma. Sounds like a super me- superhero name. <laughs> the enigma. <laughs> enigma. Yeah, and it's it's it's, it's funny actually because there's been there's actually been a book uh, written on autism. I think it's by Uta Frith, um, called I think it's Autism Explaining the Enigma, <laughs> uh, which is quite interesting because I was actually called that um, by a teacher. Um, she just couldn't they just couldn't understand me because um, my skills were all over the place. In some areas, I was excelling, like I could read far above my age because I learned to read before I started school. But I didn't understand what I was reading. I didn't. I didn't have any comprehension for what I was reading. So my reading age was five years ahead um, of my chronological age, but my comprehension was lagging by about two years behind my chronological age. Mm. And I had no number sense. I was really bad at maths, um, which again goes against the stereotype <laughs> of autistic people being great at math. I, I'm really bad at maths, you know, to the point of dyscalculia. It's it's really bad. I, I, I had literally no number sense at all. My my worst ever GCSE score was in statistics. I, I liked like the algebra kind of section to it. I like kind of the um, anything that required sort of logical thought and, and letters and stuff. But as soon as it came to maths and lots of different functions and different statistics and learning different formulas it just completely just washed over my head <laughs> <laughs> yeah because there's this kind of stereotype isn't there that autistic people love maths or are great at maths okay, which I think can be quite damaging to those of us who who do really struggle with it or who are just not interested in it 
Um, and, and of course, I don't know why I was diagnosed so late. Being female probably had some part to play in that. In fact, I wasn't stereotypical. I was, I, I spoke really well. You know, I'm, I'm what you could call, I guess, hyperverbal in a sense that language and just talking, I guess, is something that I've always been able to do. But people often just focus on that. And I think, oh, you could talk really well. You know, you can put sentences together. But actually, they don't understand that behind that, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of problems. Like I'll be taking things literally, um, your whole communication aspect where you don't quite understand what someone is saying to you. But because you can talk really well and you can present as this very verbal, I presented as a very verbal person, I think that maybe led people off the scent a bit. And of course, also in back in the 90s, autism wasn't really as understood as it is today. People only really understood the very extreme sort of, I guess, more classic manifestations of a child not speaking, going to a special school, kind of sitting in a corner, walking yeah. back and forth and being very obviously different. Um, it just wasn't on people's radar so much in the kind of mainstream settings as yeah. it is now. Because I guess one of one of the, the common sort of misconceptions is that you know, like with, for example, like the tr- the triad of impairments. You know, you've you've got actually two different sections that are, t- are sort of to do with each other, but are differentiated. So, like one of them is kind of speech and language and ability to kind of verbalize things and and communicate. But there's also like the other part, which is the social side, which has all the the nonverbal stuff, the context, the emotions, the expression particularly for, for myself I, I i i read at quite a young age and i was quite verbal i was i was able to kind of you know to, to talk about autist autistic people being being very a, a very old young person and a very young old person <laughs> you know <laughs> so so i would i would engage in conversation with adults because i found kids just too too difficult to communicate with yeah pe- people just just get those so sort of two things very confused sometimes the ability to verbalize and and communicate with language doesn't always weigh up with someone's ability to read social situations and and understand the nonverbal stuff and you know all that kind of behind the scenes communication other than you know straight up direct speaking yeah, I think it's this a very old, old fashioned view of, of what autism is, as being um, the idea that autistic people completely lack uh, any ability to sort of communicate verbally, a sort of, sort of classic idea. But again, of course, speaking, it, it's not quite the same thing as, how can I put it? It's like there's many different facets to communication. Like, I mean, at the moment, like doing this podcast, in a sense, we're communicating, but we're communicating information. Mm which is just one way of communicating, but in an actual social situation, say, where you're trying, where you're in a, say, where you're doing small talk and that kind of... With neurotypicals. Yeah, you're not, like, communicating information so much. It's more about communicating other things like feelings and that, I think they call it social pragmatics. Mm. That form of communication is what all autistics struggle with, regardless of their ability yeah. to talk. It's almost like the talking um, becomes a sort of smokescreen for... For the fact that beneath that there are all these other problems. Yeah, the the best way to kind of demonstrate that is to compare the differences between an autistic person talking to a neurotypical or, or any kind of neurotypical group and an autistic person with other autistic people. It's like in a, in a normal sense, you kind of you know start out with a small talk, trying to get a, an idea of who they are based on how they act and what they do and their eye contact and all of those non-verbal things and then you start kind of going into the kind of like experiences and how things make you feel and stuff that that seems to be like the main way that the kind of neurotypical dialogue tends to go whereas comparing that to when autistic people sort of meet each other and chat to them it's very much this is who I am this is what I think about this shall we talk about this and the reason why I like podcasting so much is is because that's that's my my baseline preferred method of of talking, exchanging information. It's I think people looking in on to autistic people talking is very much like we we sort of you know take a shortcut and we we go straight into a certain topic and and start talking about it. 
And I don't know about you, but I I I, I tend to like collecting details. So yeah. when I'm when I'm with someone, I often want to ask them loads of questions. I have this thing where I just like accumulating information about people, almost like an, I'm an mm. inquisitor. Well, I guess it's it it's it's kind of like our main way of feeling comfortable with somebody. I guess most people they would see whether your personalities jam together or whether whether the conversation flows or, or anything like that where for us it's like which what, what are their opinions on life and what are their their interests and what kind of things can we talk about like what things do they understand and education and stuff like <laughs> it's very much as you said yeah i guess sort of a exchange of information yeah and the fact that we don't like naturally know like i think non-autistic people have this intuitive understanding of what's appropriate and not so they don't have to think about it all the time they just know naturally how to socialize whereas because like autistic people um don't have that built in naturally we're having to work it out mm. all the time you gotta do so much like cerebrally like it's it, nothing comes na- hardly anything comes natural to you unless you've done it thousands of hundreds and hundreds of times in a in a particular setting with particular people so a few months back i put out an episode with my friend nick ransom and we were going to talk about ocd and autism but we ended up talking a lot about relationship ocd because it it was something that i'd never heard about before and he was talking kind of about the sort of atypical ways that ocd can manifest I think I think you you you're quite a, a unique guest in that sense. You know, it's it's a unique situation. You know, we're we're in this isolation. We're constantly under the threat of getting infected, and and you you told me that you know there was a lot of negative impacts um, on your life, particularly due to your OCD. So, could you tell us a little bit about how OCD has affected your life? Oh, yeah, so um, my OCD um, has always revolved around uh, fear of germs and illness. Um, it first started for me sort of around mid-childhood. So my earliest recollections of when I developed OCD, I'll say I was around sort of maybe six, seven, that sort of age. Um, and it all, And it came about really from taking things literally. So I actually remember I was in year three uh, at primary school. So I would have been about sort of seven years old uh, and I was sitting on a carpet. And um, you know how children often like they play with their shoes when they're sitting on a carpet. They kind of pull pull their shoes. And and I did that, and uh, as many kids do. And uh, another boy was doing it. And and a teacher said to him, he said, you need to go and wash your hands. You could get a disease from touching your shoes. Um, And that kind of stayed in my head. And um, and I was like, oh, oh, my God get a disease from this <laughs> the demon shoes <laughs> and, and it, it just shows how, I, I guess how, how how big an impact it had on me I can still remember that episode all these years later and uh, the other one was um before uh having our lunch we were always told to go and wash our hands but we're never told how long to wash our hands for just that it's important to wash our hands so I I didn't know you know no, no one told us how long so I'll be I'll be washing my hands for ages um other kids notice it they noticed it and they they say, oh, you're washing your hands for a long time. Yeah, so it, it came, I think a lot of it came from taking things literally. And uh, then it, it just became more extreme as I got older and more aware of the world around me. It became particularly bad when I was at secondary school and I became more aware of like, how diseases and illnesses are passed on. Yeah. And also around food contamination as well. The food technology teacher really scared me when she showed us a video of, of a man getting sick from eating uh, a little bit of pink chicken oh, no. and the aftermath, you know, of him with salmonella in, in quite sort of graphic detail. So that really stayed with me. And um, I stopped eating chicken, you know. Uh, I, I actually still do now. I, I can only eat it if it's like um, shop bought and it's like already cooked. Um, I haven't overcome that one yet. Um, but that's just an example of like of, of how this literal thinking, not quite understanding, being very confused, led on to the development of ocd and related phobias so so yeah so nowadays i avoid people who look ill and this is this is before covid by the way so i avoid people who look ill so if anyone's like coughing sneezing he's obviously got a cold or anything like that 
I will be right the other side, say, off a shop. But say if someone's coughing in a shop, I'll be right the other side. And then I'll be thinking for a long time, oh, my God, oh, my God, did they, did they infect me? Did they infect me? And, like, a thought going through my head. So, yeah, I don't cook raw meat or anything like that. I can't handle raw meat. And I have a lot of health anxiety as well. For a long time, I remember I went to the doctors compulsively for a while because I was convinced that I was going to have a heart attack um, because I was getting, like, aches and stuff. And um, the doctor checked me out. And she was like, no, you're absolutely fine. Your heart's healthy. Your blood pressure's normal. It's just anxiety. Eventually, I, I realised that. And nowadays, when I get exactly the same aches, because I know that they're anxiety, I don't think catastrophize them. And they're not as bad. When You know, like when you focus on something, yeah. it actually becomes yeah. worse. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so it was all anxiety, you know, because when you're anxious and tense all the time, you do sometimes get aches and pains, which is kind of like normal when you're anxious. But because I'm, I catastrophize, I... I really, I was convinced that there was something wrong with my heart. Mm. So I kept on going back to the doctor. There's a word for that, isn't there? I can't remember. What's what's the word for when you think you're ill all the time? Oh, hypochondria? Hypochondria, yeah. Was it yeah. kind of like that? Yeah, yeah, definitely I have hypochondria, which is just, I think generally it's like a fixation on illness and it's worry that there's something wrong with me. And, and like, I'm the worst patient ever. So when I do get ill, I'm I literally, it makes me panic. I can't take it. I can't tolerate it. I'm like, oh no, what's wrong with me? Is this really bad? Am I going to die? Oh, do I need to go to get doctors? <laughs> so I think that that as well, it's, it's a sense of being out of control because being being autistic, I, I, I really need to be in control of everything. And of course, when you're ill, you're not in control. Yeah. And also when you're ill, you can't follow your routines. And, and I think a lot of it is wrapped up with this fear of not being able to follow my routines, a fear of change. I like to I like to be in the same bodily state all the time. I don't like any deviation from my feeling of normal. Yeah. So illness is a massive threat to the sort of I guess the sort of very existential threat to the sort of meaning in my life. I think um, um, I can imagine that it was it was difficult, especially in secondary school, because for me it w- it was the case where my anxiety would base basically cripple me on a quite a regular basis. So I'd I'd go to the nurse. Um, with bad stomach ache and headache and muscle tension and all that kind of stuff. I think that that was mostly due to kind of the environment. I didn't like the unpredictable environment of being in a school with with lots of un- uncontrollable and illogical kids. So I, I very much got sick quite a lot. Now, whether that was actually me getting sick or, or me, you know, experiencing the, the symptoms of anxiety, I don't know. So I do you, do you think that that kind of heightened state of anxiety kind of caused caused a lot of physical kind of symptoms to to appear and yeah i mean like i think because when you're anxious you often like tense up and it affects your breathing and things that can then sort of potentially result in a sort of panic I, for a long time i didn't even know i had like panic attacks someone had to tell me um that it was actually a symptoms of panic mm. because i i thought i always thought that panic was like where you'd be like you know, like really obvious, we often see on TV and stuff like really hyperventilating. Yeah. I thought that's what panic was. Um, but panic isn't always obvious like that. Because I, I think I have kind of like sort of silent panic attacks because I don't kind of let other people know I'm in a state of panic because I never really communicate my feelings. So I'm quite closed off on a feeling level. You very much kind of go into shutdown rather than yeah. down. So I can literally be with someone in a kind of state of panic and they won't know. I might even be smiling looking completely okay but actually inside i'm in extreme anxiety mm. i i i understand that <laughs> it's very much and i think um, a lot about the sorry carry on thomas <laughs> <laughs> well i i i do get that because you know for, for a long for a large part of my life i was kind of in in the taekwondo world confrontation has always been something that i find excessively difficult so when when i was kind of on my way up doing sort of local competitions and stuff and fighting with with other people, I kind of learned to suppress my panic. Like on the outside, you know, like people would tell me who who watch who watch me fight and are interested in my fights would say, you look so confident, <laughs> you, you look so in control and relaxed and stuff. Whereas like on the inside, it's like a constant battle to stop myself from like hyperventilating and rocking and and showing all those kind of typical signs of anxiety and stuff so i think i do get get what you mean to to some extent 
Yeah, I also wanted to add that uh, when I was at, because I got germ phobia when I was at um, secondary school, um, it's, it's a particularly harrowing part of my life, which I often don't like to think about too much. But um, I used to um, basically hold my breath whenever someone was like coughing and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I would be trying to hold my breath under go thinking that if I didn't, if I held my breath, then I wouldn't be breathing in any germs. But of course, all that does, it gives you a headache and means mm. you can't concentrate at all. And the thing is, I couldn't tell anyone about this. I didn't talk to anyone. My parents knew that I had OCD because, you know, there's only so much you can control with hand washing and things like that. But I don't think I knew the extent of it. I still, ha- I still haven't told my parents to this day about some of the things I did because I don't want to like, you know, I didn't want to kind of, I guess, uh, I was worried about what they would say, you know. Mm. And you, you meant like um, telling people as in like people around you at school or? Yeah, I, d- I, didn't, I didn't tell anyone. I, I kept it all very much to myself. And whenever my parents drew attention to it and suggested I had OCD, I got really angry and defensive. I was like, no, I don't have any problem. Like, I'll be mm. really defensive about it. And it's the same with, with autism as well, actually, because uh, my parents first suspected I was autistic um, sort of around my early teens because my dad was a teacher. So he worked in a college and um, he'd gone on some training course. It also there was um, someone in his class who was autistic and my dad could see parallels between me and her. Mm. And he used to he used to joke about it, like at the table, you say, you're behaving like asparagus because he called it asparagus in a joke. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually, and it's funny enough, it is actually a book called Asparagus Dreams. Uh, written by an autistic woman which is interesting because it uh, so it makes me wonder how many other people have come up with this kind of pun because like mm. asparagus is burgers you know uh, well, the, but the yeah usual it, it one makes... is um asperger's <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah for south park yes asperger's oh one. you've seen that one <laughs> yeah. it's so funny oh, yeah <laughs> yeah um but i i got so angry though whenever it was mentioned i think because me- teenagers kind of they want to fit in. If if anyone suggests to them that they have a condition, it can make them feel really cornered and defensive because mm. it almost feels like a threat to their identity, say, as someone who's just like everyone else. Well, I think it's because, um, you know, when you're a kid and stuff, you rely solely on other people to keep you alive and to keep you safe and to keep you nourished. But when you when you sort of enter that teenage state, state state uh, that teenage age you develop a lot of self-awareness and you know you you could say that, that a lot of that is to do with like the prefrontal cortex with with the development of that you also develop a bit of an ego as well so you, you feel very much like you're the center of everything and um a lot of rebellion towards parents and towards teachers and to other people is is based on that kind of desire to show people that you are kind of independent and sometimes you can go a bit bit to the extremes to deny things that, that are obviously blatantly obvious for me that was depression and self-harming and anxiety and stuff like I was having panic attacks and I was very depressed all of the time thinking you know a lot of suicidal thoughts and but it, it was it was always something that I kept to myself and to specific people that I'd talked to about it. For for a lot of that time, my parents knew that I was struggling, but they probably didn't realise to the extent that I was because I was trying to <laughs> show them that I was independent and my own person and, and all that kind of stuff. And when you are autistic as well, you do feel even more kind of vulnerable and alone because everything is so uncertain and frantic and uh, turbulent that you, you you gotta put extra effort into trying to protect yourself I suppose and also I don't know whether you found this but for me I, I and I still do I can find it quite hard to really talk to people how I'm actually feeling because I like to kind of I don't like to appear kind of weak or um vulnerable or things like that I like so it's quite hard to kind of open up to people about hmm. my feelings um, yeah. So when people are like, oh, how are you? I'm like, I'm okay. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Which kind of, it, but also I, f- I find because I don't really understand feelings or emotions that much. It's kind of a rather alien world to me because it's not logical because I'm quite a logical person. 
Yeah. I mean, there's lots of times I don't have feelings. I have very extreme feelings, but it's it's kind of a, a world that I find rather th- uh, threatening. Yeah, because if if you don't naturally um, or comfortably understand the the social emotional world it, fr- from that kind of logical standpoint, it can feel very unpredictable. As as I said, like it's it's very difficult to control. It's very difficult to understand and navigate. Because there is something called alexithymia. Yes, yeah, I'm I'm definitely alexithymic. Yeah. That's that's I think it's very 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 common um, among autistic people. So it's time for a quick mention from our sponsors, Timo. If you love visual support in your scheduling, Timo is for you. The app was designed for people with ADHD and autism and helps empower users to schedule visual routines that work. Users say that Timo can help reduce stress and support executive function, which are both two things that I struggle with myself. Learn more at www.timoapp.com or just type in T-I-I-M-O into your search bar. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. Your support means the world. Anyway, let's get back into the show. So yeah, one thing that I wanted to ask, which I thought was quite quite interesting, quite a good comparison point. Do you think that having OCD as an autistic person differs from how your average neurotypical would experience OCD? Um, well, I think for me, and I, I can only speak very personally, of course, because all people with OCD and all people who are autistic are very different from one another so other people might not relate to this but speaking very personally I would say that my autism means OCD is experienced less as an illness I don't see myself as ill because often OCD is um, talked about like as as a mental illness which it can be for some people uh, particularly if it's making a person feel very very distressed and to the point of say depression maybe and, and where they literally see no point in life and, and it zaps them of all their energy and they can't follow their interests and things like that then yeah you could say it's entering illness territory but for me I don't see myself as ill I see it as more a part of my way of being because I, I can't really remember a time I mean I mean I'm sure that, I mean there was a time uh, but I just can't remember it really when I when I didn't have some degree of OCD I mean it, it did largely develop out of my very literal thinking style I would say that my interests and routines uh, do help me deal with the downside of OCD and I, I call this autism's healing mechanism. I think it's funny how autism works in me. It, it, on the one hand, it can make me very, very anxious and has given me and has largely contributed, I think, to the OCD and anxiety for me. Although the OCD is um, separate from the autism, it's at the same time how can I put it, it's, it's kind of come out of the autism in the sense that the autism has made me more, more vulnerable to it. And I think because of my very literal, obsessive way of thinking, that has made me vulnerable to develop OCD. So in that respect, it, I, I think it probably does have a lot of neurological overlap with the autism for me, even though um, if you're looking at the strict diagnostic criteria against separate conditions, I think that in terms of like the brain and neurology, it probably are very much part of the same kind of difference for me Mm. there are some aspects that you know to to kind of the diagnostic method of autism around sort of routine and as as they would say rigid thinking and an over dependence on logic i can imagine that you know some of those patterns of behavior kind of lend themselves more to an ocd diagnosis one thing that i think we, we agreed on when we last talked about it was you know the the difference between um being autistic and being very very rigid in your routines and stuff is that it's something that you want to do and it doesn't cause you discomfort or distress whereas ocd if you don't do that to the letter or you don't go through these particular rituals then there is a large amount of stress and discomfort from it sometimes it can be hard to separate the two for me because um my interests are extremely obsessive and that's because of the autism um they give me a great deal of satisfaction and meaning 
and I'm, I'm very glad that I do have very strong interests and routines I think if I didn't have what I call this sort of self-healing mechanism that autism gives I think then all I'd be left with is the negatives of OCD and my life would maybe I would then become mentally ill so I think in a sense autism does help me by, by giving me these more positive obsessions but, I guess, but but my interest can also take a form of a kind of compulsive OCD element as well at times um, because I'm a perfectionist. So sometimes there's always that element of anxiety and stress bear, even when I'm doing something I love because I want to get it perfect. Um, I'm always thinking, like for example, with my cooking interest, I'm always um, obsessing over, oh, what should I cook next? And that can then make me a bit anxious. But at the same time, I almost need that anxiety because if I didn't have it, I would have a void and I wouldn't have anything there. So it's a kind of strange dialectic in a way, a kind of um, positive, but then also negative, like a sort of yin and yang. Yeah, 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 I can see that. What One of the things that you highlighted that kind of the difference between neurotypicals and yourself kind of experiencing OCD is that it's it's very much founded in logic. A lot, a lot of people with OCD who aren't autistic, I guess, would have a lot of compulsions to do things that don't particularly make sense the the owner of my boxing gym that i go to um he has to like move the door handle up and down because it helps him control control the feeling that that his gym's going to burn down and obviously that doesn't make any logical sense at all but with with yourself and your your kind of germophobia you know germs are things that exist and washing your hands and being cleanly and avoiding sick people is a logical way to avoid being sick would you say that the reason why, why you would be diagnosed with OCD is, is because of the kind of because um, you know you know most most people don't want to get sick and and die from an illness <laughs> like I can say <laughs> the majority of the population for, for you do you think it's 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 like that logical danger that the danger of something is like inflated to a, a massive degree. You know, when when you compare yourself to to another person. Yeah, I'll tell you, I'm very risk averse, and um, when it comes to my OCD, there is a great deal of overlap. I think with my autistic need to follow very strict routines, because the way I see it is that if I were to catch an illness, then because I have very strong memories of being ill and the way that it messes up my routine and the uncontrollability of it and the unexpected nature of it, um, and the, the sort of suffering and stuff, I think I'm very sensitive to pain as well. So the memory of it, combined with my need for routine, really kind of amplifies the sense of risk. Because if I were to catch the, the illness, I wouldn't then be able to follow my routine. It would mm. disturb, it would, it would mess up my sort of my day. I wouldn't be able to read. I wouldn't be able to do my cooking. All the things that bring life meaning. And I think non-autistic people, because they're not so fixated on particular interests or routines, they're, they're just more laid back, I think. Yeah. Uh, they can see the bigger picture maybe they might be like oh well no one likes getting ill but you know but you recover and stuff like that and you know and, and maybe going out and putting yourself at risk is worth it because of these other things even if there's a slight risk of getting ill and stuff whereas I just focus on the illness as like this major catastrophe kind <laughs> of the center of your decision making and what you do yeah but I was getting better before COVID with kind of rationalizing it to some extent, because um, I did have, I, I had some uh, cognitive behavioural therapy in the past. It didn't cure me of OCD. And I, I have to say that it, it wasn't particularly helpful because it wasn't tailored towards my autism. Mm, that's, that's a big problem, like with traditional kind of therapy. I mean, it's, it's crazy to, to think that, you know, just how high the rates of, of mental health and comorbidities there is with, with autistic people. That the, the, the therapies that are traditionally used to combat those conditions aren't geared towards autistic people. So, I got like um, I, I went through at least seven or eight years of counselling. I didn't feel like that helped me at all. <laughs> like <laughs> every week for like seven years, seven or eight years, didn't see much benefit from it because they were they were approaching it from a very emotional angle rather than kind of teaching me about it and give me the research and the statistics and the, the methods and you know the, you got to have that reason to do stuff rather than just kind of as, as you said I guess kind of being laid back and going with the flow 
in any sort of sense. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, though, um, when, when you're talking um, earlier about the question about how OCD is different for me being autistic, one, one thing I would like to mention is that um, my interests and routines do help me deal with the downsides of OCD because I referred earlier to autism what I call autism's healing mechanism um, and my, my very strong interest can actually at times motivate me to overcome aspects of the OCD so long as the interest outweighs the anxiety mm-hmm. so I can give an example when I was a teenager one of my major special interests was babies and young children I was really really obsessed with babies um, and this was all because um, it was actually a spin-off interest because I was, I, was, I was very into the actress Kate Winslet. And the actress Kate Winslet had a baby called Mia in the year 2000. And um, as soon as she had a baby, I was like, oh, this is really interesting. I need to go and find out everything I can about babies so I could better understand Kate Winslet's existence. So I started reading parenting <laughs> magazines like that. And, and so I, I, I volunteered at a nursery school. Um, I did work experience there um, and I carried on volunteering at the nursery school for several years and this was with uh, sort of two to three year old children they nearly always have colds and coughs and things like that because you know they're building up their immunity and things so when you go into a nursery school you're surrounded by <laughs> these little um I don't know what you call them um plague rats <laughs> yeah like <laughs> carriers <laughs> yeah and so I had to then sort of override my OCD in order to be in a situation among lots of kids who were coughing and you know mm. Um, and, but because my interest in babies and toddlers was so strong, it motivated me to be around them. I mean, I still got triggered and I still think, oh, I hope I don't catch it. Oh, they're, they're infectious. But because I had the motivation, because of a strong interest to be there, it meant that I could tolerate it in a way that I wouldn't normally if I didn't have the interest. That's really interesting because, you know, like we were talking about alexithymia and emotions and stuff. I imagine that, that a lot of the the impact of, of OCD is emotional fear. You know, like fear is, is quite a big driver for, for humans and, and our behavior. But I guess like your desire to learn about something and to, you, you, your interest in something, the positive emotion that sort of surrounds that is quite, um, kind, of, kind of overrides the negatives that, that you experience. Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, I used to say when I was obsessed with Kate Winslet, I would often say, you know, if Kate Winslet had a really bad cold or something, but I had to go and meet her. Um, so if I was invited to kind of uh, sit down next to her in London, but she just happened to have a really bad cold and she was like really infectious, I'd be like, I'd still go and see her, even though I had OCD and I'd normally avoid someone like that with a plague. But it'd be like, it's Kate Winslet and I'll be catching Kate Winslet's cold. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> So we talked a lot about the the difficulties of OCD, and I know you've said about how special interests has been quite a big sort of grounding factor for you and in terms of dealing with the many facets of uh, OCD. But are there any sort of other strategies or or help that you've received that help with your OCD or or the anxiety that follows with it? Uh, So... I would say that in terms of uh, strategies, so other than, as we talked about already, my, my interest uh, as, a, as, a, as a form of distraction is one of my major strategies uh, for dealing with it. Because, say for the sake of argument, I'm out and about. Uh, at the moment with COVID, I don't really go out uh, at all. My, uh, my dad does my shopping for me. He does my food shopping because I physically cannot enter shops at the moment. I'm lucky that I live right next door to my dad and he's happy um, oh. and supportive and willing to do my shopping for That's me. That's great. Yeah, and I mean, of course, not all people with OCD are fortunate in that respect. Not all of them have that support network. And I, can, I can't imagine what it's like for them. Um, you know, there must be others out there who, who just physically cannot enter shops at the moment. I mean, when I say physically, I mean literally physically. It's like the brain just makes the body go into absolute like paralysis where you mm. cannot physically step into a shop. I mean, I don't know what I would be, what I would be, what would happen if I didn't have my dad to do shopping for me. I, I guess I would probably be buying food off Amazon and spending a fortune on a can of beans, but like cost about twenty pounds of Amazon or something, because you know I'd rather do that than go into a shop. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, a strategy, I guess, at the moment that's helping me deal with it, so that uh, I can avoid some of the extreme uh, streams of the OCD because I'm not actually going into situations that make me feel contaminated so obviously if you're not going to situations that make you feel contaminated you have less compulsion I mean you could 
I guess co- it is a coping mechanism, but I guess it's also a symptom of OCD and anxiety, sort of avoidance. Yeah, definitely avoidance. I mean, I mean, normally before COVID, I was trying to work on uh, reducing my avoidance and I was trying to use those cognitive behavioural strategies that I'd learned from when I was in therapy. As I said earlier, although the therapy didn't really help because it wasn't tailored towards autism, it did still give me some kind of strategies. I think, I think a lot of these strategies, though, also came about via reading because I've done a lot of my own reading and I'm reading a lot of self-help books and things like that. So I get, a lot of it, I think, came about from my own study as opposed to what I learnt from actual therapy. Um, so I probably would have found it, discovered it even without therapy, actually. But before COVID, I was using some of those CBT strategies, you know, like where you have to like assess the evidence. Mm-hmm. You have to kind of think, OK, so say if I was going in a shop and there was someone um, coughing or whatever, you, you sort of think, well, I've got a good immune system. What's the actual likelihood of me catching it? You know, all those things. It only helped to some extent, I have to say, because when you're like really anxious and things like that, you tend to um, not really listen to logic. So if they're coughing, I'd still likely go right the other end of the store mm. or things like that. And that avoidance has always been a big factor. Well, it's like uh, phobias. Like I, I have a experience with phobias, with needles. I can go into into a doctor's office to get like a, a vaccine jab or, or something like that and be completely fine up until the point where a needle is at least like a meter from my skin and then I just get this kind of blood rush to my head it's suddenly a, a massive amount of energy and irritability and I just like either move away or can I stop the needle from from going into me <laughs> You know, phobias are quite like a protective mechanism for me. It's, I guess, strangely, it is it is kind of like a logical thing for me because I I don't like the idea of something being inside my body, like anything like pregnancy or obviously it's not going to happen to me, of course, <laughs> but um, anything like that, like parasites or needles or implants or or anything like that, just seriously like messes with my head. So I, c- I can imagine that, you know, like if you have a phobia of germs, that you, a lot of that is kind of an involuntary response. Yeah, I think, I think I mean, it's, it, 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 yeah, definitely it feels involuntary. Um, it, It's kind of almost like, yeah, that fight or flight thing, like you're in survival mode. And when you're in survival mode, all logic stops because it'd be no use trying to think logically if a tiger was running after you, mm. you'd want to escape straight away. And so I think it has this kind of evolutionary, it's like an evolutionary sort of throwback to kind of uh, wilder times that technically we no longer yeah. need to behave like that. But if It's like that, that's the reason why we have so many spider and snake phobias, because if you get bitten by a poisonous spider or snake, there's nothing that you can do about it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to kill you like, <laughs> in those times. Yes, yeah, so you don't have time to try and think logically and stop and think. You have yeah. to get out straight away. Well, we have anti-venoms and anti-poisons and stuff now, but it's still like that, that, that threat that it poses to you because of the way that you, your brain's wired or, or your learnt behaviours or knowledge of things, you still have that very much kind of fight or flight response to things that, that people, people wouldn't worry about so much. Yeah, and I mean, and you could think like maybe like say uh, the way we've evolved, like if we were living say in hunter gatherer times, people with a sort of OCD type of brain or like hyper aware and hyper alert and phobic, or because they're being alert all the time, they won't be. It might not even be OCD in that situation. Those types of people will be most likely to survive because mm. they're going to be so risk aware. Whereas now it is it is a disability and a hindrance because we no longer need it. But actually, you could think of it almost as sort of. Almost you could think as an extension of the immune system in a sense that the brain is almost like a first arm of the immune system yeah. in terms of preventing foreign bodies even coming into you in the first place. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there is definitely... <clears throat> well, it's like it's like with anything, isn't it? It's like with um, the problem of, of obesity and stuff. Like We're, we're designed to, to, to gather resources and eat when we can and then store it. Uh, we're not supposed to have endless supplies of food and nourishment. And because, because of that, we, we can get so overnourished that we become obese and we become fatter and fatter. And it causes a lot of health issues that usually wouldn't arise in a, in a sort of 
natural pre-modern time kind of state yeah it's like it's like a genes for that makes someone more likely to be a bees i think i was reading that the reason they cap exist still is that they did have a purpose and a benefit in times mm. when food was scarce because those people could then hold on to the um you know they, they could they were better able to sort of store store the food and things yeah it's the same with with adhd as well like it's proposed that the adhd was beneficial because you, you'd be able to keep yourself alive like if you're able to stay constantly hyper vigilant and aware of your environment and and small things small kind of noises distract you and, and grab your attention then you're going to be a lot safer and you'll be kind of like the the watchdog of, of the tribe if that makes sense <laughs> like it's a lot to do with the kind of the, the interaction of these things with modern society like with learning and stuff adhd is, is is not good because if you get distracted by small noises in the corner in a very safe confined building um it's going to distract you from your learning <laughs> but i suppose in, in the, those kind of pre-modern times that distraction was good but other than like your, your special interests and that kind of flow state that autistic people get when we're when we're interested in something and the, the the avoidance is there anything else that you that you found that helps I, I mean i find the internet is, is a source of help um i guess if, in terms of like distraction i spend a lot of time on youtube and social media and stuff like that uh, also i i do have a support worker when after i got diagnosed um i was referred to my local autism charity and i was given an autism support worker and their job is really to sort of like help me to go out and about because at that point in time, um, just shortly after I got diagnosed, I literally was hardly leaving a house at all. So um, we kind of worked on kind of just going into the library and things like that. Um, I've come a long way since then. And um, over the years, um, obviously, with, before COVID had struck, um, <laughs> I was, you know, I was traveling. I was going on the train only only to certain areas that I felt safe. Only I was, I was only going places that I felt confident going to, like mainly local places. Hmm. I, w- I got there through the help I'd received from one particular support worker who was now um, sadly left, um, was absolutely amazing. And she was with me for um, gosh, almost yeah, it was about eight, nine years. Um, and she was really good. She, uh, she just she just completely had a knack um, and really helped me, um, you know, travel and kind of break through a lot of my phobias and helped me so much more than any CBT could ever help me. That's brilliant. We talked a lot about OCD and the interaction with this whole COVID isolation situation for you. How do you think the government or your local council would have changed things if they really understood the impact the COVID and this isolation could have on people on the spectrum? Well, I think more online support would be good. Um, so things like Skype support. I mean, as I said, I'm lucky in that I do get support from a local autism organisation anyway that are funded by by the local authority. So I get that support once a month. But I think um, at the moment I would quite benefit from like more support. So like more online support, maybe like sort of mentoring and specialist, say, sort of therapy services I would really benefit from. Mm. Just to have a more regular input, maybe more like a sort of once a week kind of um, input from an autism expert or someone who can help me would be really useful. Yeah. Also, more help with food shopping and support for carers. I mean, like my dad, he he doesn't mind doing my food shopping for me, but I kind of feel we haven't had any kind of um, real input from, say, social services. I mean, I'm I'm under social services because I get support. You know, I've got a care package and stuff. But I haven't really kind of like got in contact with us to say, oh, do you need any help with that? Can we help organise this and things like that? So it's like my dad's very much doing it on his own. Mm. Um, Because we have to like commonly ask for any support. It's not like others are kind of really checking in on us. We have to, there's a sense that we almost have to like actively kind of seek the support out. Uh, Which is one of of the difficulties of being being on the spectrum because you have to actually engage socially with someone. And and a lot of the times when you need the support, your social batteries is very, very flat. That's, That's one of the things that I struggled with at university. They had the support there that I could use, but nobody was checking in and asking me and telling me where to go. As, as when I moved into my accommodation, they didn't. It was, but it was very much. I had to go to them directly and ask about it and say, "What can you help me with?" Yeah, and I think that's really unfair because, like, it means for 
many people just are not getting the support they really need because it's like a, it's almost like a kind of um it's a self-fulfilling thing like say you lack the ability to to find out about the support in the first place because of your problems mm. you need support to help you deal with those problems but those very problems are not allowing you to get the support i think what what you said about that sort of one-to-one contact is is quite an important thing to highlight because there is extremely high rates of social isolation and and as we said social anxiety so being able to have that kind of one-to-one chat with somebody you know for, for someone who doesn't have a, a network of friends or you know even a family or, or a supportive family it's very important and it, especially to you know with the same person over and over again that kind of routine aspect to it I can imagine that that would make a lot of the the difficulties that I've seen, you know, from from people telling me about, you know, how COVID's affected them and make it a bit easier. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as I say, I'm lucky enough, I do get at least some of that support from the awesome organisation. It's better than nothing. And I think I'd be struggling even more if I didn't have it. Um, And the autism groups I go to have been really good. I'm still getting, um, you know, I I still connect with them uh, online. Every two weeks, basically, I have a group I attend, and that's been invaluable at this time. But I just sort of feel uh, maybe more of that, really, I think. And also, I think it should just be rolled out more uh, sort of nationally, because it really is a postcode lottery, like where you live. Yeah. I think it should just be almost like a given as a kind of right, I think, that all autistic people should be able to access these types of services if they so wish. Mm, yeah you know obviously it's a choice some people might not want to access them but I think the choice should be there and that pe- people should be um given the information and, and helped to get the support so they're not left to their own devices yeah I guess this is one of the situations where the the high functioning label that's that's applied to you know people with ASD1 or, or Asperger's can be quite detrimental in terms of you know GPs or doctors or psychologists or, or councils thinking about the impact of particularly particularly covid on the, the mental and, and physical health of autistic people because we have that kind of that that sort of high functioning label i suppose that that limits people's concern for us in a lot of cases would you agree with that oh yeah definitely i mean functioning labels are really quite uh yeah controversial because they're often based upon how well someone presents themselves and usually it's to do with how well you speak. Mm. Um, so someone might see me and, and, and say, you're really high functioning. In actual fact, one time um, someone did actually say that to me. They couldn't understand uh, why I was receiving um, su- a type of support I was getting. They were like, well, you seem really high functioning. Um, you seem really high functioning, don't you? How did you get your support kind of thing? It's quite an intrusive question, really. Yeah. And it's, it's all because of the way I present myself. And, and often people do this um, without, they don't really know you. So they don't actually really know what you struggle with. Um, they're just going on how you present. I, I, I wouldn't say I, I, I am always particularly high functioning. I mean, in some areas I function well, like I could talk, I can, you know, I, I can live sort of semi-independently. I can function well in certain areas, but of course I, I, I can't work, you know, because of, because it gets dental OCD and things like that. So in that, in this sort of occupational sense, I'm not really functioning, you know, in the sense of being integrated in society. So functioning is just so, it's, it's really complicated because we're not kind of uniform people. We might function well in some areas and then really struggle and not function well at all in other areas. Mm. Um, and I think and I think it can mean that people say underestimate your need for support yeah. because of the way you present yourself and vice versa. Someone else might appear, say, low functioning. They might actually have qu- function better than someone who appears the opposite. I think that, you know, we, we need some way to, to differentiate people's ab- ability to be independent. The, the actual functioning labels as a concept itself is an, an important way to to distinguish how much support someone needs. It's just, as you said, I guess, for, for outside outsiders and, and people that talk to you, like social workers or, or GPs or, or anything like that, would sort of underestimate the the need, need for support based on your ability to socialise as kind of like a they kind of use that sort of linear spectrum model rather than the the kind of spectrogram, the the spiky profiles. Yeah, of... I really think they should be coming at it from the person, from the individual. They should be getting to know the person. What does this person struggle with? 
what support does this person actually need as opposed to just judging them on how they appear, uh, how they present themselves. And I think they should try and refrain from comparing people against others because, yeah, this functioning thing is is really a throwback to the time when uh, autism was thought of in a very, very narrow sense um, as someone who uh, can't talk, who has an intellectual disability. The thing is, someone who, who doesn't have an intellectual disability, he's autistic, but say has a sort of average or above average general intelligence, is obviously going to present very differently to someone who, with an intellectual disability and speech and language problems. Uh, but you're not comparing like with like. So it's kind of futile to say that that, per- that person is lower functioning, because in some respects, obviously, they are. But you're not comparing like with like. It's a different condition. And it doesn't really matter that someone else might be functioning lower in in terms of the person's need for support is absolutely irrelevant that person needs support and they should be judged in their own terms I think their own merits as it were Mm. what one one of the difficulties that I have around sort of functioning labels and and stuff like that is generally most people don't particularly understand autism to 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 any sort of grade they might they might have a particular idea of what an autistic person would be like and the way that they behave and and all that kind of social difficulties and stuff but i think in terms of speaking i do think that it's not necessarily the functioning labels that are the problem it's it's the way that people attribute functioning labels like ways to compare compare people and differentiate between people are quite important oh yeah definitely i'd agree i mean i i definitely i think i mean i think that autism itself because autism it, we do need yeah I'd agree with you that we do need some way of I think distinguishing say a person's maybe type or type of need or things like that because autism isn't one thing like saying that someone is autistic is, isn't really giving you that much information mm. about them in terms of their yeah. support needs and things because aut- I would say that autism is really just a, a sorting house if you like or sort of you know, where you put lots of different people <laughs> who are all diagnosed autistic into mm. the same bucket but actually they're but they don't have the same condition as uh, in a sense so that they all have autism but autism is is such a wide wide thing it's so broad especially now yeah i mean probably on a neurological level there are probably actually very distinct different types of autism i would i would imagine yeah there, there, there are a lot there are a lot of different kind of classifications that have been given it's um it's it's difficult nowadays because we did used to have a lot more commonly new, used terms, whereas now it's just everyone's lumped into the, the autistic label and we're, we're given levels. <laughs> it, it helps people to assign support to people and, and, and all that, but it doesn't necessarily... Uh, losing the train of thought. <laughs> it's a very complex social issue. Honestly, like I think... It's it's important for us to differentiate in in some way between people, as as I've said, you know, to some extent, the ability to socialize, the ability to talk and communicate with others is quite a massive functioning skill. You know, your your ability to kind of oh, yeah, communicate yeah. with the outside world. I mean, you know, the controversial when it was very controversial at the time when they got rid of Asperger's from the DSM. Yeah. I, I can kind of understand in one sense why they did it, but I kind of feel that it was possibly a mistake to just have one autism spectrum disorder without further specifications. Like I know like you mentioning earlier, like the, the one, two, three kind of specification mm-hmm. level. That in a sense is just like recreating the old functioning labels in a way. I sort of I, I'm not sure how I mean it's really controversial and it's, <laughs> it's an absolute minefield. Um but I because autism is so many different things like you were saying like obviously the ability to talk and stuff is a functioning skill and, and, and obviously sets people apart with that skill from those say you can't talk at all I can't imagine what it's like to be a non-verbal autistic and I'm really glad that the type of autism I have is not non-verbal autism because I think I mean I've seen videos of like say non-verbal kids and things and what their families are going through and things and yeah I mean not to be able to talk or have any like functional competence at all like that I, I can't imagine what's that like and you know I'm just so glad that I do at least my intellect is spared and things like that um so and but obviously like the type of autism I have and the type of autism you have is it's very different to those people who can't talk at all 
mm. and things like that. And yet we also have our own struggles yeah. in terms of being understood. And I don't think we can really compare them against those who can't talk and things because they're very different struggles. That's why, that's why I, t- I tend to sort of view functioning labels as that kind of differentiating thing because we can't just say this person has Asperger's, this person has autism because it's not, it's not a thing anymore. You know, not yeah. everybody knows what the levels are and, and what that means. And it's not very well integrated into the base knowledge that medical professionals or, you know, like GP general practitioners. And the only real kind of differentiating thing that you can use is those, those sort of, I guess, sort of functioning labels without going into detail. Um, but speaking in a general sense, it's important to kind of be able to distinguish because you know like oh yeah I'm just yeah. gonna myself from someone who needs 24 hour support I mean what I usually do is I, I usually do refer to the old labels which I think like things like Asperger's it's, it's still very much in a public understanding so if I'm talking to someone say who's very well versed in autism and understands the nuances of it I'll just simply say I'm autistic yeah but if I'm speaking to say a member of the public who doesn't have much understanding I will say um I'm autistic Asperger's type because they understand that. Yeah, it's a very interesting sort of thing to to think about. I think generally with social media and stuff, with we very much boil down people's views and opinions based on what type of words they use, and sometimes that can be a difficult thing. Because if I was to use a functioning labels to dis- differentiate between people and people that know about me and know about my views and the reason why then you know people kind of lump me into that category of being very judgmental and and all that whereas it's it's more of a generalized way of telling people apart and what kind of support they need it's a minefield as, as we said but yeah i think we should probably try and move on to the the last bit i think it's definitely something important to talk about you know it's it's a big thing we've talked a lot about OCD we talked a lot about autism and the interaction and and how that interplays into the situation that we find ourselves in during sort of isolation and tears and covid stuff it's all very crazy and unpredictable and strange and it's it's been really nice to kind of chat to you about it i think it's it's good to hear it you know from from someone who is is very very directly affected by this this current situation so just to kind of round up the podcast, what three main things do you think are really important to highlight? Some things that, that people can take away from this podcast. First of all, I'd say that autism can make people more vulnerable to OCD due to the literal and obsessive thought patterns. So there's a high correlation between being autistic and having OCD. Obviously, not all people not all autistic people will have OCD. There'll be many autistics who don't. And not all people with OCD will have autism. But having one or the other does mean that there's a higher likelihood that someone will have the other condition. So it's something that I think therapists need to bear in mind when they're, say, treating someone for OCD. If that person then is talking to them, say, about problems making friends and social difficulties and other things that aren't directly connected to their OCD, the therapist does need to have a back of their mind. Mm, I wonder if this person could be autistic. Secondly, I would say that OCD is not always experienced as an illness, but as a logical part of a person's being that needs to be managed as opposed to cured. So um, OCD means different things for different people. It can be experienced as a very severe, profound illness that really makes a person very distressed, might need to be medicated. But for other people, it's it's more like a, almost like part of their personality, but which means that they're always going to be vulnerable to having OCD and it's not going to go away and they might not need to take medication, but they do need to have someone there who can help them work through strategies so that they can better manage and live with their OCD. But it's not necessarily the case that they're ill. So I have OCD, but I do not experience it as a mental illness. Finally, number three, I would say that there needs to be far more specialist OCD therapy provision uh, that provides uh, long-term support because often the only support that is provided is a six to eight weeks of CBT and then a person is 
you know, sent off in their merry way or not so merry way and um, left to their own devices. And then you end up almost like with a revolving door system where the person gets better temporarily, but then needs support again. Because OCD very often is a lifelong condition. So we need to be thinking more about management as opposed to, say, cure. And that needs uh, more consistent, regular support, which I think is absolutely vital. And currently, unfortunately, we don't have that support because OCD really is the Cinderella, I think, in the mental health ser- the mental health system. We just do not get enough. It's just not talked about that much, um, I would say. So those are my three points anyway. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. I can, I can tell that you put a lot of thought into those points. I, I, everything, everything is planned for me, everything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do anything spontaneously. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I'm those. not good at doing things on the cuff, so I've got a little script. But <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Thank you very much for those. I've got one last question for you, which is an open question. What does autism mean to you, Anna? So I would say that for me, autism is an information processing difference that is pervasive in a, se- in a sense that it affects every area of my life. Um, I would say that the social interaction problems are really just the tip of the iceberg. Autism means that I focus very intensely and obsessively on narrow areas to the detriment of other areas that are less interesting to me. So that can be both a positive and a negative. The positive side means that I get so engrossed in things that I can, for at least some of the time, switch off my OCD anxiety uh, because I'm focusing, say, on a YouTube video or I'm reading a book. And at that point in time, I'm so focused and engrossed on that that all of the OCD anxieties are no longer at the forefront of my thinking. But the downside is then that other things can get neglected because I tend to monofocus on things. My, my line of thinking is so mono, it's so almost, you could say, blinkered that I'm, I can kind of ignore the other stuff that needs to be done. The world can be very overwhelming and confusing. I mean, it's too fast, it's too loud, it's just too much going on at once. It's like it's too much information that you have to process. I would say that autism affects everyone very, very differently, but all autistics are united by their atypical information processing resulting in social difficulty and difficulty processing sensory information. In a sense, autism is a nation or an island that contains many cultures that share the diagnosis, but they're very different at the same time because autism is an umbrella. Someone might think they know about autism because they've read all of the books, they've seen like loads and loads of autistic people and then they'll see another autistic person and I have to start right from scratch because they'll because that other autistic person will literally confound everything they think they know about autism because autism is so varied. So that's kind of what I'll say in, a, in quite a long-winded way of putting it. <laughs> Thank you very much for those. It's always nice to hear. I, I like that you, you've taken that kind of more scientific, logical kind of thought about autism um, some some people it's it's a very emotional kind of thing you know like when I ask the question some people will give their feelings and thoughts and how it's interplayed into the, the different experiences that they've had or some people will kind of speak about it in generality and sort of give the you know the facts and the logic and stuff behind it's always it's always nice to hear what what people come out with um so sadly, this is this comes to the, the the very tip of the the iceberg, the very tip of the tip of the iceberg. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fa- thank you so much for coming on to talk about OCD. I know it's it it can be quite a a personal topic to kind of discuss. I usually sort of give people the, the opportunity to kind of share links and and to their like social medias and the, or website or or anything like that but do you have any 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 of any of that, that kind of stuff to share uh <laughs> yeah I mean I've got a I've got a small YouTube channel which has been running now for about two years um oh. and it's called Autism's Individual so um going off the top of my memory <laughs> it's ridiculous I can't remember I think it's a capital A but if you type it into YouTube it should come up it's possible that some of uh, my followers are actually tuning in right now to this podcast, so they might be pleasantly yeah. surprised to hear me. Welcome. <laughs> be like, oh, oh, she's talking on a 
podcast. But, Welcome, um, Autism's individual crew. Yeah, and, uh, and obviously <laughs> I'll um, I'll mention as well when I'm on there about your your um channel, Thomas, so that you can hopefully get some more subscribers as well. Brilliant. But it's been a real pleasure to be on here. And of course, if you want to catch the Forty Audio podcast anywhere else on this lovely internet that we have. You can always find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube under Asperger's Growth. All you got to do, type in 40 OT Podcast, should come up. If you want to stay up to date with my life, the kind of things that I do behind the scenes, all that kind of juicy, lovely stuff, you can always follow my social medias, all at Asperger's Growth, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you have an exciting or interesting story, or a topic that you're particularly passionate about and want to come monologue on the 40 OT podcast about, you can always contact me on my social medias or my email, aspergesgrowth at gmail.com. And with all that said and done, that is all of the, uh, the information that I wanted to put across. <laughs> what have you got planned for this, this evening, Anna? Uh, so this evening, I'm going to have my dinner. That's kind of like a full front main thing I think about this time well please get off my dinner what are you cooking um I'm making uh it's a pasta dish it involves um disloni pasta which is like these tiny little tubes they, they look a little bit like penne but a lot shorter so they're a tiny little pasta shape mm. so a bit like baby penne I love the uh the kind of compact pasta like the, the fusilli pasta yeah I do too yeah I, I love yeah I love that one yeah like good little shapes I like well Everyone out there, I'm going to leave you with this little piece of information. Did you know that you can cook pasta in a microwave? I found this out during my time at university. All you got to do, boil a kettle up, get a bowl, (laughs) put your pasta in, fill up the bowl of hot water and put it in the microwave. Then you'll get your your pasta nice and ready. I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. (laughs) I figured it out while trying to dodge cooking (laughs) <laughs> you really don't like cooking so i tried to find as many ways as possible to use a microwave and um, that's one of them so uh enjoy that information people and i'll see you in another episode of the 40 Arty podcast see you soon <laughs>